Hey everybody, Frank Spear back with you for another episode of Watch This. I made a video recently about death, and I just kind of wanted to reiterate that here and make a bit of a stronger case for it. I'm making the case that the way that the word death is used throughout the Bible is speaking of covenant death. It's speaking of a spiritual type of death. It's speaking of being cut off from the covenant people of God. All throughout the Old Testament system, we see this beginning in Genesis, in the day that you break this commandment, you shall surely die. Well, Adam didn't die physically, but he was cut off from Eden, right? He was banished from the covenant land and the covenant people. We see it with Cain, is cut off, banished from the covenant people. All through Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, right? If you break these commands, you shall surely die. Same thing is being repeated there. I don't believe that that's physical death, right? If you break this commandment, you shall die. If you break that commandment, you shall die. They weren't taking people out and killing them because they carried sticks on the Sabbath, so they were biologically putting them to death. I don't believe that's what was happening. The Bible uses the word death in the Old and the New Testament, and we'll see this, borne out. Generally speaking, there of course does talk about physical death at times, biological death, but generally speaking, in covenantal terms, when, when it's speaking about the nation of Israel in covenant with God, and them dying, or the Israelites themselves dying, when they transgress the commandment of God, it is speaking of them being banished from the people, banished from their tribes, banished from the holy land and the holy people and the sacrificial system and all that. They were cut off, not physically killed. Now, there were times, I've said this in other videos, where they did physically die, where God physically killed some. But generally speaking, I'm making the argument that that's not the case. Now, you flip over to the New Testament. And before we do this, let me say, read through Deuteronomy again, read through Leviticus, and put this connotation on those passages and see what I mean. You'll see this is undeniable. In specific verses, it says that if you commit such and such a transgression, you shall be cut off from the people of Israel. Out, put outside the camp, outside the land at times, right? Then in other times, it talks about the same transgression. It says, if you commit this transgression, you shall die. You shall be put to death. Meaning, cut off from the people, not physically killed. Now, come to Romans chapter 7. Let's bear this out in the New Testament and see if that was their understanding of it. Romans chapter 7. We could read a lot of passages on this, but let's start here. Let's begin at verse 7 of Romans 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law itself a transgression? Of course not. May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know what transgression, law transgression was, except through the law. The law says don't do this, so I know what not doing that, I know that not doing that thing is a sin, is a violation, is a missing of that mark, right? For I would not have known about coveting if the law didn't say, you shall not covet. But watch this. But sin, taking the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Apart from the law, there is no sin. Right? If there's, if there's nothing saying you should do this or you shouldn't do that, if, nothing, if, there's, if there's nothing saying that, if there's no knowledge of good and evil, so to speak, back to the garden. If there's no knowledge of good and evil, then you can't partake of that. You can't violate it if you don't know what it is. There's no stated commandment to either keep or break. Then there's no sin. There's no violation of it because there is no commandment. There's no standard. Watch this now. Verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law. I was alive. But when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. Now we know for certain Paul is not talking about physical death here. He's talking about covenant death. I violated the commandment of God, 
and therefore I was out of fellowship with God. That's why those animal sacrifices had to be says. So Paul says the commandment, watch this. He says the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. Right? That's why he died covenantally. That's why these blood sacrifices had to be made daily on their behalf. Right? To cover over those sins until Messiah came and took them away. And brought a new system that would be devoid of these things. Okay? Verse 11. Watch this. Or I mean, verse 10. And this commandment, which was to result in life, actually proved to result in death for me. Not physical death. This is the same death that Deuteronomy and Leviticus, etc. are talking about. Covenant death being cut off. Right? From covenant fellowship with God. That's why they had to go and make sacrifices. If you transgress this, go to the priest, they make a sacrifice for you, then you're restored to life until you sin the next time. Then you've got to have another sacrifice. And even if you sin without knowing it, right, uh, there were sacrifices made for them, so forth and so on. There's a whole big system put in place because they were constantly violating the law, whether outside of themselves or within their hearts. Okay? So then verse 13, Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death. So Paul is constantly here talking about his death, not a physical death. Okay? Now, flip over with me, and let's keep this definition in our minds, okay, in the forefront. Flip over with me to John chapter 8. Well, watch this. Verse 50 of John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking, But I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and one who judges. Truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you, now we know that you have a demon, right? Now we know that you're talking crazy. Abraham died, and the prophets also died, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never taste death? Surely you're not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Who do you make yourself out to be? Now see, they were making a mistake. They were misunderstanding. Just like Nicodemus, who was also a Jew, right? Who was a teacher of the law. He misunderstood. They saw all these things as physical. But they were not physical. They were spiritual things. Right? Jesus is talking about a spiritual death, a covenantal death. That's why Paul calls these things a mystery. In 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about the revelation, he's saying, I'm speaking to you something that you didn't understand in previous generations past. Right? The Israelites have come to misunderstand these things. That's why there were arguments between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, whether there would be a resurrection or no resurrection at all. Many of them understood, understood the resurrection to be physical. Many of them understood that there would be no type of resurrection at all. Okay? So Jesus here is talking about covenantal death being cut off from covenant fellowship with God. And he says here, look, he says, I say to you, if anyone who keeps my word, that's my covenant, right? Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, the old covenant system, but my word, the new covenant system, will never pass away. So he says here, anyone who keeps my word will never see death, will never see covenant death. You can't be cut off from fellowship like you were under the old system where you're put out from the people of God and cast away. He says, if you believe in me, you maintain that belief in me, right? Then you'll never be cut off. There's no law system. There's not all this covering of animal blood you'll have to go through in the new kingdom. You just believe in me. Flip over to John chapter 11. Lazarus dies. Now we believe he died physically here, right? So there is physical death, no question. And Jesus says, verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, I believe that also Martha misunderstood. She believes there's a, a resurrection of the physical body coming. I think she was wrong. 
Now you can laugh and you can scoff at that and all of that, but the teachings of the entire scripture show otherwise. She was mistaken as a Jew, like many of them were, about what the resurrection was. She got it right that it would come on the last day, but it was a resurrection to spiritual life, to a new covenant life. Watch this. Jesus said to her, watch this. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Watch Jesus' answer. Watch this. He says, I'm the resurrection. It's not what you're thinking. It's not about physical bodies coming out of the graves. He says, I am the resurrection and the new life. It's me. He who believes in me will live. How do you believe if you're physically dead? He says, he who believes in me will live. That's the resurrection, putting your faith in me and coming to a new covenant life. Not what you're thinking, Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. So if you believe in me, watch this, you will live. Even if he dies, even if you die, you'll live. Right? Let's think about that a minute. I submit to you that Jesus is teaching the same thing Paul was teaching. Even if you die in the way that Paul said he was dead, covenantally dead, you will live in the resurrection by putting your faith in me. That is the resurrection. Jesus himself says so. She says, I know my brother will come to life again. He's physically dead. I know that he'll be raised up out of physical death on the last day. Jesus says, no, I'm the resurrection and the life. You misunderstand. Just like Nicodemus. He said, now, Martha wasn't a teacher in Israel, but Nicodemus was an expert in the Old Testament scriptures, an expert in the law, and he, and he got it wrong. So is it any surprise that Mary has it wrong? Martha, I mean, of course not. Jesus says to Nicodemus, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't understand these things? If I tell you earthly things and you don't get it, how are you going to understand if I tell you heavenly or spiritual things? You people are clueless. That's what he's saying. Are you a teacher in Israel and you don't get it? You don't know what the, it means to have the Spirit of God and to come to life again? That's the resurrection. Think about the parables that Jesus told. Think about the parable of the prodigal son. My son was dead, but now he's alive. Was he dead in, the, in, a, in a biological way? No. He was cut off from covenant. Just like Paul says in Romans 6, 7, 8. You see, it, it all works. It's all connecting. Begin to read the scriptures with this definition of death in mind. And you'll see. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Everyone who lives, right? Now listen. Everyone who has the new covenant life believes in me, watch this, will live. He'll never die. He'll never be out of covenant fellowship with God. He'll never be cut off from the community of faith, from the community of the faithful. Flip over to Luke 20, which gets a lot of press, has been getting a lot of press lately in the videos. This is talking about Leverite marriage, even though some say it is not. It certainly is. Before we do that, I'm sorry, let's just show again in 1 Corinthians 15, which I've done many times. I've done four hours on the resurrection. So if you're really in for it, grab yourself a cup of hot cocoa or a nice cold beer or something and sit down with a nice uh, pipe. <laughs> That's your bag. And uh, listen to my videos on the resurrection. You'll see this borne out. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's talking about the same kind of death, right? He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in the moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet. I've already gone into all this, so I'm not going to again. Watch the videos on the resurrection. The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised. The dead will be raised. Even though these people were born again, even though these people were in fellowship with Messiah, they were still awaiting something. They were awaiting the removal of the old system in A.D. 70 at the trumpet, right? This is talking about A.D. 70 here in verse 52 of 1 Corinthians 15. 
And those of us who are in this intermediary condition, coming out of the old covenant and into the new covenant as it's approaching, right? Paul says in Romans 8, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Israel, old covenant Israel is the body of death, the community of death. Under this animal sacrif- under these animal sacrifices, under the blood, right? Yes, Jesus had died for them, right? Yes, he finished up that system of, of the animal sacrifices as counting towards the believers. However, that would not come into its full fruition until the old was passed, put away, put down, till all his enemies would be put under his feet. Then the adoption would come of, of the new sons of God. The, the, then the marriage would come, the new marriage. They were awaiting all of that. They were not fully out from under the thumb, if you will, of the old system until it perished. It's the already but not yet. Right? So it couldn't be fully ratified, the new kingdom, until the old was gone. Now watch this. He says, and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. That's why Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? For this perishable must put on the imperishable. This old covenant body that's passing away. This world that's passing away. That, that's the world of Judaism. Paul says in a lot of other places that that system was passing away. Paul is now talking about at the time when it does pass away, right? That perishable, right, was put on now the imperishable. And the mortal body of old covenant Israel that would die must put on the imperishable. And those Israelites that came out of that old covenant system as the saved, as the redeemed, as the 144,000 of Revelation 7 and 14 would be the remnant, the all Israel that would be saved of Romans 11. That new body, right? That new body of Christ that would begin the new kingdom. They were the new founding fathers, like there were founding fathers of the old covenant system. Now watch this. But when that happens, verse 54, when this perishable will this perishable body will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? The sti- now watch. The sti- here's what the death is he's talking about. The sting of death is sin. Right? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin, law violation, the power of law violation is the law. That's the death he's talking about. The death that came from law violations. That's the same death Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 6 that we read about. That's the same death Jesus was talking about. That there would no longer be any death. That type of uh, uh, being disfellowshipped from God out of the covenant people banished from the people and having to be covered over with animal blood that system was still intact until AD 70 and many of the Jewish believers Christians were still partaking in the temple and in the sacrificial system and struggling with whether or not they should be doing that We see that all through the New Testament. Not until that was gone would they be fully in the new. So this this understanding of death, not as biological death, but as covenantal death, is what is the point I'm trying to make here as you're reading through your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That's why in Revelation 21 it says there will be no more death. It's no more of this covenantal death because that system was gone. Now flip over to Luke chapter 20. Now there came to him, verse 27, some of the Sadducees, again, who misunderstood things and say there's no resurrection. They were thinking about a physical resurrection. And they didn't believe in one. And they questioned Jesus saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us 
Now notice, Moses wrote, so they're talking about the law here. Some say this isn't talking about levirate marriage from Deuteronomy chapter 25. This is just talking about marriage in general. No, he says Moses wrote. And then he goes on to, they go on to quote from Deuteronomy 25. Which in Deuteronomy 25, if you go look it up, it's talking about levirate marriage. And what was levirate marriage? Well, you know what he, they say here. They say a woman had a, a, a husband. That husband and that woman together produced no children. And that was very important under the levirate marriage. Now go back and read Deuteronomy 25. The whole point there is the land inheritance and the name of that man, that husband, was carried on through his children who inherited his land inheritance that was given to him by God under the old covenant system. The children inherited the name of the father and kept the land in the family. If that father died and didn't have any children, then that land would be given to another and his name and his inheritance would be cut off from the people of Israel. There's that death again. There's that death. That man's name would die. His inheritance would die. He would have no children to carry on his name. We see this in Ruth. Before we go on here, well, let's do that. Let's look at Ruth. If you will, let's turn there. Let me find the passage. Hold on. Okay, Ruth, chapter 4. Let's begin reading verse 5. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth, the Moabitess. You must take her as your wife. Watch this. Why? The widow of the deceased in order, watch this, to raise up the name of her deceased husband for his inheritance. So there's a resurrection even here. You have to bring his name back to life. <laughs> Keep his name alive. Jump down to verse 10. Watch this. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Melon, to be my wife, watch, in order to keep alive, to raise up the name of the deceased for his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. And you are witnesses to this today. Wow, do you see this here? The reason that these brothers, if a man has a wife and the man dies without having children with her, one of his relatives, his brothers, or a relative could marry this woman, have children with her, and then keep the land and the inheritance in the family, and the children would use the name of the original husband. That's why you see Boaz marrying her, Ruth here, to keep the name in the family. That way those children would grow up, they would inherit that land, and they would have a possession, an inheritance among the people of Israel. If not, they were cut off from the people of Israel, dead. The name of the father would die, and his children's name would go to a stranger if the woman's married a stranger. And therefore, that Israelite man, original husband, would not have an inheritance. It was a way of keeping it in the system for that man not to die covenantally. Same thing here. That's what. So they're, they're asking Jesus, if that happened and seven brothers married this woman and they all physically died without having any children, then the woman died in this physical resurrection, which they didn't believe in, and it wasn't a physical, physical resurrection. They were misunderstanding it, but they were trying to trap Jesus. So they're saying, if there is a physical resurrection, when they, everybody comes back to life again out of the graves, who will be married to this woman since she had seven husbands? Now watch Jesus' answer. He says, the sons of this age, this old covenant age, those in Judaism, those living under this system of Moses that you're asking about, those sons of this age who marry and are given in marriage in this way, in this liberate way we've just you've just asked about. Of course that's what he's addressing. He's addressing the very question they asked and they quote from Moses and they quote from Deuteronomy 25. So those who say this isn't talking about Leverite marriage, it's just talking about marriage in any way, shape, or form in any age. Wrong. 
Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage in this way that you've just referred to. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age to come, the resurrection age, right, which is not a physical resurrection, but it's believing in Messiah and entering his kingdom, living not under the Mosaic law, but under the law of Christ, which is love. Those who are worthy to attain to that, who put their faith in Messiah, watch this. He says, that's the resurrection. You're mistaken about what it is, but that's the resurrection. That's the age to come. Now, if the age of the Mosaic law was a time period, then the new age is also having to do with time. Not taken away into an invisible realm somewhere. It's an age. And those words always refer to a period of time on planet Earth. You can't take that word and make it into something else. However, those who are considered worthy to attain to the resurrection and the age to come neither marry nor are given in marriage in this Leverite way. Watch this. Because they can't die anymore. There's that word again. He's talking about the covenantal death. He's talking about the death of the Leverite marriage. The name being cut off. The inheritance being cut off. None of that is going to matter in the new covenant age. That all goes away. If you were living here in the first century, you would have totally understood what he was talking about once he explained it. Now watch this. They cannot even die anymore because the reason is they are like the angels and are, the, are, and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. They already have an inheritance in the new age to come. It's not a physical land. It's not being a part of a physical genetic tribe. It's no None of that matters anymore. They're sons of the resurrection. They're new types of sons. The same sons of adoption that Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 8. Okay, now watch this. They are like angels. Now, I'm going to submit to you, and I've done this in other videos, angels, is simp the word simply means messengers. It means servants, workers. And we see the priests in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, being referred to as angels. Joshua is referred to as an angel. We see this over and over again. Moses is referred to as an angel. God will raise up an angel for you who will bring you into the promised land. Joshua bring them in, brought them into the promised land. He told Moses, I'm going to raise up an angel. The problem is we have a connotation, a definition of angel in our minds of chubby little babies with wings or something flying around in unseen, invisible realms. That's not how the Bible sees angels. Yes, there are a few difficult passages, but by and large, these are referred to as men, even in the New Testament. It says they saw angels at the tomb of Jesus, and in the next verse and in other passages in Synoptic Gospels, it says there were two men there. Well, which is it? Angels or men? Well, they're synonymous because angels are men. And when we see them in the book of Revelation, they're symbolically, they're, sim they're referred to symbolically. They're no more flying around in heaven than uh, did the beasts have four heads with eyes all around and so forth. That's all symbolism referring to things that were taking place on earth. I submit to you that these angels he's referring to were the Levites, the ones who were the workers in the temple, who did not, now listen, listen, watch this, who did not follow that Leverite marriage system. They were separate from the other tribes, and that was not a condition for them. They married one wife, and that was it for them. Go read about the Levites and how they did not need to partake in the, the, how the Leverite marriage vows or Leverite marriage system uh, rules did not apply to them. They married one wife and the land could not be cut off from the Levites, ever. They could not be cut off. They could not lose their inheritance. So they did not fear that kind of death. They didn't fear that covenant death of losing their land because for the Levites, the priests... The angels, it wasn't dependent upon their children. That's what Jesus is saying here. They understood. Jacob had a dream 
and he saw angels of God ascending and descending, right, on, on a stairway to heaven. Heaven is the temple. We know that. Okay? That's another video. Heaven was their temple. It was the place of God's dwelling on earth where God, the heavenly being, dwelled with them on earth in the Shekinah glory, the cloud that came down from heaven and dwelt in their tabernacle and then later in their temple. First it was on Mount, first it was in the burning bush, on Mount Horeb, then it went to Mount Sinai, then the presence, the cloud of presence went to the tabernacle, then the cloud of presence went to the temple, then the cloud of presence went to Jesus. Jacob has a dream that the workers of God, the priests, are ascending and descending on the stairway doing the work in the temple. And that was the spot later on that the temple was built. So folks, get this concept in your mind of covenant death. Because that's the death that the Bible is speaking about. And when you understand it that way, then all of this comes alive in a new way. Well, I appreciate you guys taking the time today. I realize I haven't expounded every verse on this. That would take me forever. And there are some difficult passages, no question. But once you get this... Now, don't there be people who will watch this and say, ah, he's just messing with the plain words. Let the plain words just say what they say. Well, if we do that, it doesn't work. It gets ultra confusing. Try it. Why do you think there's so much controversy about this? Because if you just read it, for death is biological death, and you, you apply that meaning, um, you're going to get really confused really fast. Paul doesn't apply it as physical death, biological death. Read Romans 6 again. Read Romans 7. Read Romans 8. Paul the Apostle, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, talks about a covenant death that had to do with law and law transgression, and the people of Israel were under that system, and they were dead. That's why Ephesians chapter 2, he says, Before you came to Christ, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but you've been made alive, that's the resurrection, in Christ. That resurrection life began for them individually during that 40-year transition period. But when the old passed away in AD 70 and it was no longer there, it no longer existed, the whole body of the remnant, that new church, that new community of true Israel, right? The remnant of Romans chapter 11, the all Israel that would be saved, rescued out from the old system. They were the resurrected ones. They were the new creation. And they began a new kingdom. Thank you guys. See you next time.